The bacteria we're discussing today is not a coccus nor a bacillus, but it's a combination of both. That is coccobacillus. Dear students, please welcome Bodytella pertussis. Assalamu alaikum everybody. Today we'll be looking at Bodytella pertussis. But before getting into the video, I'd like to tell you guys that these videos are meant for educational purposes. Things and treatments may change with time. If I get wrong or miss anything, your input is always welcomed in the comment section. So, let's jump straight into the video. It's a gram-negative broad. It's an obligate aerobe. It is cocobacillus, as I've told you, and it's catalase positive. For those of you guys who do not know what's catalase, let me tell you. Catalase is an enzyme that's released by some bacteria and is not released by other bacteria. And what does this enzyme do? It converts hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. And oxygen is responsible for forming bubbles. If we perform catalase test in a test tube or a microscopic slide, we'll see bubbles in microscopic slide or a test tube. If we see bubbles, then this test is going to be positive. And if we don't see, it means that this is catalase negative test. So, body pertussis is catalase positive, which means it converts hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. Body pertussis is responsible for causing pertussis. It's whooping cough or 100-day cough disease. As in this picture, you can see the cocobacillus body pertussis. Pertussis is highly contagious disease that occurs primarily in infants and young children and has a worldwide distribution, but it can also occur in adults. Here, I would like to take a moment to thank Picmonic for sponsoring today's video. Picmonic is an audio-visual learning platform that is tailored to assist the needs of medical students. It provides valuable resources like video lectures, visual mnemonics, study scheduler, and quizzes. We'll be talking about the visual mnemonic of body teller purchases by Picmonic in today's video, so stay tuned for that. And also, if you guys are interested in signing up on Picmonic, I've got you a discount code and link in the description that will give you 20% off on your purchase. So what are you waiting for? Go sign up and have fun learning. Body teller pertussis has got various virulence factors. Attachment of the body teller pertussis to the respiratory epithelium. And this is done by the filamentous agglutinin, protactin, and fimbri. Here you can see body teller pertussis is attached to the respiratory epithelium. Bodytella pertussis also releases certain toxins like pertussis toxin, adenylate cyclase toxin, and tracheal cytotoxin. We'll talk about these toxins later in today's video. All right, everybody. So now we are going to look at the visual mnemonic of Bodytella pertussis by Picmonic. Bodytella pertussis is shown by border pearl tusks. This is the border, these are pearls, and these are the tusks. So Bodytella pertussis, border pearl tusks. Bodytella pertussis is a gram-negative bacteria because of its relatively thin peptidoglycan layer in the cell wall, shown here as gram-cracker-negative devil, this one. Bodytella pertussis is cocobacillus. It's not a coccus, means spherical-shaped, nor a bacillus, means a rod-shaped, but it's a combination of both. That is cocobacillus, which is shown here as coccoid rods. These are coccoids, and these are the rods. Bodytella pertussis grows on border jangu agar, pictured here as the border jenga in the petri dish, which is specifically designed to optimize growth of bodytella species. The A and B components of pertussis bacterial toxin operate by ADP ribosylation of the inhibitory or GI subunit of the G protein coupling complex, recalled here by the ADP Red Bull with A apple and B B toxin, this one by inhibiting GI regulation. That's not GI gastrointestinal, that's capital G, but small i, that's inhibitory protein. By inhibiting GI dysregulation of conversion of adenosine triphosphate, ATP, to cyclic adenosine monophosphate, CAMP, where adenylate cyclase occurs, leading to excess CAMP in a variety of tissues with the accompanying clinical signs and symptoms. This is demonstrated in this picmonic by the inhibiting chains on GI Joe guy, causing up arrow CAMP, the cyclic AMP. One of the manifestations of this process is lymphocytosis, portrayed by lymphocytes with lymph lines, because of altered cellular signaling mechanism that allows fewer and fewer lymphocytes to enter lymph nodes and confront infectious agents, forcing them instead to remain in bloodstream 
resulting in lymphocytosis on lab analysis. The IL cells of pancreas are another location where excess cyclic AMP causes a disruption in homeostasis, leading to an increase in insulin release with a subsequent drop in blood glucose, predisposing to hypoglycemic episodes. This is shown here by up arrow insect syringe. The initial stage of infection is called the cataral phase, seen here as the cataral sign and infectious baby, this one, which is the most infectious period of the illness, lasting one to two weeks and clinically presenting with non-specific symptoms of malaise, cough, mild fever, venerea, tearing, and sneezing. The second stage is called the paroxysmal phase, portrayed by Pierre Oximal's sign, which is considered the predominantly symptomatic period and is characterized by paroxysms of intense coughing that can last up to several minutes. These coughing outbursts are occasionally followed by a loud inspiratory whooping sound, which is where the colloquial name of whooping cough was derived and is demonstrated here by a coughing baby on whoopy cushion. Treatment of body pertussis falls to the macrolide antibiotics depicted by macronilides, these ones, which include erythromycin, azithromycin, and clarithromycin. I hope you guys like this pygmonic. And if you guys are interested, don't forget I've got you a discount code and link in the description. But before talking about body teller pertussis in detail, we should know how the bacteria are classified. Bacteria are further classified into spirochetes, acid fast. And there's an exception that's the mycoplasma bacterium. And bacteria are also classified on the basis of gram staining into gram positive. We're done with all of them. If you guys are interested, be sure to check out the channel and into gram negative. Gram negative are further subdivided into cocci, like Neisseria, Neisseria gonorrhea, and Neisseria meningitidis, and also into rods like aerobic, for example, Pseudomonas, anaerobic, like Bacteroides, and facultative. Facultative are further subdivided into curved, that includes Campylobacter, Helicobacter, and Vibrio and also into straight, which is further subdivided into enteric and related. That includes E. coli, Enterobacter, Serratia, Klebsiella, Salmonella, Shigella, and Proteus. And zoonotic, that includes Brucella, Francisella, Pastorella, and Yersinia. And respiratory are further subdivided into Haemophilus, Bordetella, the topic of today's video, and Legionella. But that's not all. Gram-negative bacteria are also classified based on different shapes, like diplococci, cocobacilli, rods, and coma-shaped. Diplococci are further subdivided based on maltose fermentation. If a bacterium ferments maltose, it's Neisseria meningitidis, and if it doesn't, it's Neisseria gonorrhea. Cocobacilli are further subdivided into Haemophilus influenza, Brucella, Pasteurella, Bordetella pertussis, the topic of today's video. Rods are further subdivided based on lactose fermentation. If bacteria ferment lactose, they are going to be fast or slow fermenters. Fast ones include Klebsiella, E. coli, Enterobacter, and slow ones include Serratia and others. And if bacteria do not ferment lactose, they are going to be oxidase positive, like Pseudomonas, or oxidase negative, like Shigella, Salmonella, Proteus, and Yersinia. And lastly, comma shaped bacteria. They're further subdivided based on certain criteria. If a bacterium produces urease, it's going to be H. pylori. If it grows in alkaline media, it's going to be Vibrio cholerae. And if it grows in 42 degrees Celsius temperature, it's going to be Campylobacter gigini. Lecture outline. We're done with the introduction. We're done with the pygmonic review of body telepertussis. We're done with the classification of bacteria. Now we'll be looking at the morphology, habitat in transmission, pathogenesis, clinical findings, slave diagnosis, treatment, prevention, and at the end, as usual, we'll review the body telepertussis. Morphology. Body telepertussis is small, cocobacillary, encapsulated gram-negative bacterium. It varies in size from 0.8 by 0.4 micrometers. It might be pink or red in color. The reason is it's gram-negative. As in this picture, you can see body telepertussis. It is cocobacillus. Let me zoom in. You can clearly see the cocobacillus there. It's not a rod, means bacillus. It's not a sphere, means a coccus. Structure. Bodytella pertussis is an encapsulated bacterium. It is not responsible for forming spores. It is non-motile, but some strains like labodopted or clinical strains can be motiles. And Bordetella pertussis produces certain toxins. These are pertussis toxin, adenylate cyclase toxin, and tracheal cytotoxin. 
This is how Bodytella purchases looks like under the microscope. It's pink colored. The reason is it's gram negative. Habitat, hosts. Bodytella purchases is the pathogen only for humans. Transmission. Bodytella purchases is transmitted by airborne droplets produced during the severe coughing episodes or sneezing. And it can also be transmitted by using fomites. Pathogenesis. There are three important points that we need to know about pathogenesis prior to talking about the virulence factors. Body pertussis attach to the ciliated epithelium of upper respiratory tract, but do not invade the underlying tissue. There will be decreased cilia activity and subsequent death of ciliated epithelial cells. Let's start talking about virulence factors. The first one in the list is attachment of the bacteria. Bacteria, the body pertussis, attaches to the cilia of epithelial cells, and this is mediated by a protein on the pili called filamentous heme agglutinin. Antibody against the filamentous heme agglutinin inhibits attachment and protects against the disease. The second virulence factor in the list is pertussis toxin. It stimulates adenylate cyclase by catalyzing the addition of adenosine diphosphate ribose, a process called ADP ribosylation, to the inhibitory subunit of G-protein complex, GI protein. This results in prolonged stimulation of adenylate cyclase and a consequent rise in cyclic adenosine monophosphate, CAMP, and also in cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase activity. This results in edema of respiratory mucosa that contributes to the severe cough of pertussis. Pertussis toxin also has a domain that mediates its binding to receptors on the surface of respiratory tract epithelial cells. It is an AB subunit toxin. Pertussis toxin also causes a striking lymphocytosis in the blood of patients with pertussis. The toxin inhibits signal transduction by chemokine receptors, resulting in a failure of lymphocytes to enter lymphoid tissue such as the spleen and lymph nodes. Because lymphocytes do not enter lymphoid tissue, there is an increase in their number in the blood. That leads to lymphocytosis. The inhibition of signal transduction by chemokine receptors is also caused by ADP ribosylation of GI protein. The third virulence factor in the list is adenylate cyclase. Body pertussis also synthesizes and exports adenylate cyclase, as its name shows that it's an enzyme, because it ends with ACE, A-S-E. This enzyme, when taken up by phagocytic cells, like neutrophils, can inhibit the bactericidal activity, which means that neutrophils won't be doing phagocytosis, so there will be decreased phagocytosis. Bacterial mutants that lack cyclase activity are avirulent. Next virulence factor in the list is tracheal cytotoxin. As its name shows that, it is going to be a toxin. It is a fragment of bacterial peptidoglycane that damages ciliated cells of respiratory tract. Tracheal cytotoxin appears to act in the concert with endotoxin to induce nitric oxide, which kills the epithelial cells. Clinical findings. Pertussis is divided into three stages. First one is cataral, then we've got paroxysmal, and the last one is convalescent. We're going to talk about these stages in detail in just a moment, but prior to that, I've got a summary of all the clinical findings. Whooping cough is an acute tracheobronchitis, that begins with mild upper respiratory tract symptoms, followed by a severe paroxysmal cough, which lasts from one to four weeks. The paroxysmal pattern is characterized by a series of hacking coughs, accompanied by production of copious amount of mucus, that ends with an inspiratory whoop, as air rushes past the narrowed glottis. Although central nervous system anoxia and exhaustion can occur as a result of the severe coughing, and death is mainly due to pneumonia. Stages of pertussis. Pertussis has got three stages. First one is cataral phase. It lasts for about one to two weeks and it includes symptoms like nasal congestion, venuria, sneezing, mild cough, low-grade fever, tearing. The first phase, the cataral phase, is a contagious phase. The second one is paroxysmal phase. It is the high intensive phase of pertussis 
where all the symptoms of disease appear and it lasts for two to eight weeks. It includes symptoms like cough, post-tussive vomiting, this is the vomiting after coughing, whoop sound in between coughs, there is subconjunctival hemorrhage, rib fractures in very few cases, and cyanosis in infants or children. Paroxysms of intense coughing that lasts up to several minutes, and these are occasionally followed by a loud whoop. post tussive vomiting and after coughing, the person turns red, like the face of the person becomes red. The third phase is convalescent phase, and it varies from person to person, as it's the recovery phase. There is gradual reduction in the symptoms of pertussis infection. There might be chronic cough, which may last for a few weeks or months. Lab diagnosis. We'll need sample from the nasopharynx. For that purpose, we'll do nasopharyngeal swab, as you can see there. We'll also need a blood sample, because we're going to do blood tests. On gram staining, this bacterium appears to be gram negative. The reason is it's pink colored. On microscopy, this bacterium appears to be cocobacillus. Size 0.8 by 0.4 micrometers. It's pink or red colored. The reason is it's gram negative. This is how body teller pertussis looks like under the microscope. Cocobacillus shaped. Culture. We'll take the sample from nasopharynx. And this is taken with the help of a swab and the sample is taken during paroxysmal stage of the disease. The color of the colonies is going to be yellow. There is slow growth. We'll use two agars. What is Jangu agar that contains potato extract and Regan Loy medium that contains charcoal, blood and antibiotic. Other tests. We'll go for blood tests that will show us the leukocytosis, right? Then we can also go for a PCR that will detect bacterial DNA. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. These tests are rapid, specific, and highly sensitive. That's why they are used for detecting the bacterial DNA of body pertussis. Identification of isolated body pertussis can be made by agglutination with specific antiserum or by fluorescent antibody staining. We'll also go for serology, because serologic tests detect the antibody in the patient's serum. Treatment. The drug of choice is azithromycin. It's a macrolide antibiotic. We'll also go for supportive care, like oxygen therapy, suction of mucus, hydration, and avoidance of respiratory irritants. Prevention. There are two types of vaccines that are used to prevent the occurrence of body pertussis infection. That's the pertussis whooping cough or 100-day cough. The first vaccine is an acellular vaccine that contains purified proteins from the organism. And the second vaccine is the killed vaccine that contains inactivated body pertussis organism. The acellular vaccine contains five antigens purified from the organism. The main immunogen in this vaccine is inactivated pertussis toxin, the pertussis toxoid. The toxoid in the vaccine, the pertussis toxin, that has been inactivated genetically by introducing two amino acid changes, which eliminates its ADP ribosylating activity but retains its antigenicity. The other pertussis antigens in the vaccine are filamentous agglutinin, protactin, and fimbri type 2 and 3. The pertussis vaccine is usually given in combination with diphtheria and tetanus toxoid, and it is available as DTAP or TDAP. The DPT is the older name of the vaccine, but nowadays it is DTAP or TDAP. Certain antibiotics can also be used for the prevention of body pertussis infection, like azithromycin. All right, everybody, let's have a quick recap. The organism we discussed today is body pertussis. It is responsible for causing pertussis, which is also called as whooping cough or 100-day cough disease. It is transmitted via airborne droplets during coughing or sneezing, and it can also be transmitted via fomites. Hosts are only humans, and its diagnosis is based on gram staining, microscopy, culture, blood test, PCR, and serology. Treatment. The drug of choice used for treating the body teller pertussis is azithromycin. That's a macrolide antibiotic. And we can also go for supportive care like oxygen therapy and suction of mucus. And that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you've got any suggestions, feel free to leave them below in the comments. And if you want to connect with me on my socials, I've got my Instagram and Twitter, both with the handle Medsokrof. And I'll see you in the next video. Till then, assalamu alaikum.